Ang kutsok. Ang jumlah rap kham to ka jumla ka ni ti sa amna ka. Ai to tani pro bi ka jun te sa bi nya rong on tra chit dam bai mi no kham to ka tang sum rut ni dal chu pu ni Thank you, Mr. President. Summa Kun Lok Tien. Professor Dok Sasaja. We left talking about the importance of revolutionary consciousness as part of the CPK ideology. I'd like to quote your book, 3-3-4-6, at English 0 and it's at 195 to 196. In that book, discussing this issue of revolutionary consciousness and the importance of the communication, you quote a subsection of the Tung pa de wat nang kung kung wat jet ha pa pon ta nang ka rip jam na ke hai ta sum ruot na manesika nu na bay sum ruot manesika nu kung ke ban jet ha wai da trau ba sum at ko do chi ko sang nu kung ban ban jet na kung jum nai nu da mi jum nong chung in each party member each cadre. Everything that is of the oppressive class, the private property, of stance, sentiment, customs, literature, art, which exists in ourselves, no matter how much or how little. It is just the same. We must build a proletarian class worldview, proletarian class life, build a proletarian class stand, Regarding thinking, in living habits, in morality, in sentiment, etc. So my question is, based on your research documentation and your interviews, what was the revolutionary consciousness that CPK leadership wanted? Uh, quite simply, uh, to follow the CPK line, and to have an appropriate revolutionary stance as is evident by uh, party statutes, which mention stance over and over and over again. But again, I view this as an absolutely critical aspect of uh, DK ideology, and CPK ideology, uh, and also when I first began to talk, at the very beginning, in terms of speaking about genocide, this is a critical factor in relationship to the jam. Uh, I don't necessarily believe that there was a sort of racial intent at the very beginning. Uh, there might have been animosity of some sort there, but what happened over time is the consciousness of the jam as a group became increasingly suspect. Eventually, they were viewed as a threat and targeted. So it didn't stem from overt racism, but in fact from their inability to sharpen their consciousness as a group, the fact they rebelled, um, and to understand, I think that makes Vietnamese are a little bit different. For the job, I think that's a, uh, this is sort of at the heart of much of what was going on. It's, as an example, comparatively, if you look at Mayans in Guatemala, uh, what began as a fight with the army against insurgents, for example, eventually turned against Mayan villagers who were viewed as being you know, comparable to counter-revolutionaries and enemy forces, and they became the target. Uh, and there, anyways, I'm sure you know the literature on the findings on them in terms of genocide as well. So, uh, 
ដោយសារសំខាន់ <coughs> 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 Because it was the basis of the formulation of a pure revolutionary citizen, what's been called revolutionary in some of the literature that ហើយខ្លាំងបឡើងអនុមោទនសម្រាប់ខ្ញុំដែរគឺមានការស្លាប់លើកដើម្បីសូមលើកដើម្បីសូមលើកដើម្បីសូមលើកដើម្បីសូ
ចំពោះបានដោយជាអាចសួរសំណួរជាទៅលោកគំនាញហើយដូចជាវ័យតែមេត្រាវីបានចាក់ទៅជើងគាត់បានសំភាពកម្មតិតៈកម្មវិធី
ຈະຮູມ uh, to participate or not participate. ສາບຣິດຍາຍັງເຕັບຕາບານຍາມປີມະຊຸບາຍດາລັງກາປະນິກຳວິຊຽນີ້ຟອສ໌ທີສ໌ບານອັບບັງຄອມ required to demonstrate revolutionary consciousness. Was that a revolutionary yeah, fashioning an uh, appropriate that's a line. You know, that was the way forward to the pure revolutionary society was by following the line, having a stance, having an appropriate revolutionary consciousness. And if everybody worked together to do this, uh, perhaps it could be accomplished was the way things were thought about and you could get a super great leap forward. From your interviews and your research, if people failed to demonstrate you know, that's a, a complicated question. It would be a mistake to simply say that there was a direct singular order that went to every single person throughout the country that said anyone who doesn't have an appropriate revolutionary consciousness needs to be killed. That's far too simplistic. There were, again, as you read before, different radio broadcasts, there were letters, there were orders that went to the countryside. Uh, they are implemented uh, frequently, especially when they said, when they went out and said, oh, we've got to take a certain, a certain percentage of people away. Uh, but, you know, if you think about constraints, you might think about it as an envelope. 
it's looser, tighter, uh, and more closed. So if you think of S21, it's a very tight closed envelope in terms of the decision making on the ground. In some contexts, uh, there would be looser and there would be more latitude for the interpretation of the letters that were received um, of, the, uh, of the way things were interpreted. Uh, so I think it was omnipresent, it was everywhere, but the decision about taking people to kill, sometimes I think there were, there were well, based on a number of documents, there were explicit orders to take people and kill these classes and groups of people. Uh, and other things, as I said before, where you had one village head who was there, uh, he had a list of 30 people who were ready to be killed when the orders came down, the next village head came in, and he took the names away. So there were, you know, in that situation, the envelope of constraint was looser. So, in general, looking at the research that you have carried out, the greater someone's revolutionary consciousness the would that increase their likelihood of survival? And the lesser or the, the revolutionary consciousness, would that increase their chances of being in more danger? Uh, of being, was that a good summation of uh, what you've just said in terms of their Uh, so yes, as a general rule, uh, absolutely, uh, that's true. And I should also note, as I said before, that again, I think in the case of the Jam, once the idea came out that this group, the revolutionary consciousness and loyalty of this group was suspect, they then became targeted. You've discussed with us ways in which people demonstrated their revolutionary consciousness or loyalty to the past. Were there other ways in democratic Cambodia where they would demonstrate or followers would demonstrate their loyalty to the past other than socialism sessions, biographies, but also in what they did? Um, yeah, no, ab absolutely. So, uh, in terms of, uh, I assume I may refer to the documents that I read, or no? I think that would be okay as long as you let us know which. Which doc oh, I mean, look, the documents uh, generally that you read, yeah, yeah, the, the document from you know. Grandmother Yut. I, I, I think that's fine. Okay. It's not a document from the American Can we clarify what document this is? Sorry, I, I was slightly confused myself. Um, do you have a document in front of you that you would like to refer to and, and what is it? Look, yeah. uh, yeah, uh, so it, it's a interview with Grandmother Yut uh, that was in the materials that were provided to me to review. Uh, um, I have heard stories about her. Sorry, for interrupting, just to clarify the document. So it is on the list of documents you got from the court. Can you, I'm not sure that's the list of your endorsement. Yeah. C can somebody please look at the, can you have a look at the document and tell us if it shows the ERN number? Uh, yes, uh, so it is on the list of documents you got from the court. Uh, 
I understand you don't have the document in front of you, so we can check the URN number. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, if we can continue, and if that becomes necessary later, uh, we'll deal with that. Thank you. Um, without referring to a document um, from your research generally, um, were there other ways in which the marriage card Đề, or others in the Khmer Rouge Right. Um, so I, I don't need to refer to the document, but when people spoke about uh, to me in the village story about Grandmother Yu, they mentioned her killing her husband. Uh, but this was given as an example of renunciation to the party. So killing itself, showing that you were willing to renounce anything and everything, even a loved one, was one sign that you had sacrificed and everything for the party that you didn't have aggressive tendencies, attachments, and could focus your consciousness and be a pure revolutionary. Um, so that was from my interviews, that was mentioned in my interviews with Grandmother Yut and people, you know, that was something that was common in the And if I can uh, briefly refer you to um, that passage in your book, from Rome, the district during the DK period, and and it's a page 262 to 263. Good, and the poor and 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 เยอะมันเราได้ถือประกอบตลอดเวลาสกาลนั้นตายคาเยอะมันเราได้มันโนสิงเจตนาจมุยโกนจมุยไม้จมุยไม้ไม้ไม้ไม้ไม้ไม้
no. with this ideology? Did that, in your opinion, increase the likelihood that that Khmer would kill Khmer, would kill Khmer, would kill Khmer, would kill Khmer, would kill other different groups? Other different groups. 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 Uh, yes, and uh, I should note that as well, if you look at the context of S21, uh, evidence of this, including the uh, interrogator notebooks, which also emphasize the need to cut off your attachment uh, as well. Uh, thank you, Professor. I think we can move the last subtopic in relation to the universal factors that you say exist in many regimes that commit mass killings against certain groups of their society. One other factor that you say can contribute to that, contribute to the, the, the likelihood of mass killing, is the, the breakdown of moral restraint. Within that uh, particular uh, country. Uh, when you're talking about the breakdown of moral restraint, this is from your book. Can you explain what you're referring to? Is it looking at this issue from, a, from another angle, or is it a different issue? Um, I think I think it's a related issue, if I understand the question correctly. Um, you face a, you know, most people, especially most perpetrators who kill, uh, individuals who kill another human being, uh, everyone, most people have internalized moral inhibitions, whether it comes from you know, Buddhist, first principle of Buddhism, from religion, uh, through law, what have you, and, and genocide and mass violence, uh, you know, if the killings taking place, it's always an issue, especially when someone kills for the first time before they become potentially desensitized. How do you sort of break that down? So in the context of uh, genocide, uh, you tend to have a sort of moral restructuring that takes place where those who are killing are dehumanized. The moral rules that would normally be applicable are suspended, taken away, reversed, or replaced by an entirely different set of moral rules. Uh, and I think that was very much the case uh, in DK. Uh, and as I said before, you can see it taking place all over ISIS now, uh, many different contexts. Um, I only have a, a couple of follow-up questions for this, this issue. And you refer in your book to a decision, and it's on the 30th of March, 1976, and it's a decision from the CPK Central Committee. It's entitled decision of the Central Committee regarding a number of matters. And it's at your tab 6, and it's E3 English French and if I read a portion of that decision, it states the right to smash inside and outside the ranks. Objective, that there is a framework in absolute implementation of the revolution. Two, to strengthen our social democracy, all this to strengthen our state authority. If in the base framework, to be decided by the Zion Standing Committee, surrounding the Central Office, to be decided by the Central Office Committee, independent sectors, to be decided by the Standing Committee, and the Central Military, to be decided by the General Staff. Have you seen this decision um, so, it was mentioned 
repeatedly during the Doik trial. It's, you know, it's a well-known document. Uh, it might be in Paul Paul Plan's the future, I can't remember. But, anyways, but it was, I heard many, many times during the this, this decision, this delegation of authority to smash, first thing you tell us what the word to smash means. So, yeah, and I think Doik was asked the same question and talked about to crush something, to erase it, to crush the bits. It's like a hammer smashing something. Based on, based on your research, based on interviews you've done, does the word smash mean to kill, or is, that, is it more ambitious? Uh, it was one of the more explicit uh, euphemisms. Uh, I think Doik also mentioned another word to resolve. I think it was Warren Vett used to use, so there are a number of different words that would be euphemisms for killing, but smash was pretty, pretty direct. My question is, delegation of authority to smash to dissolve uh, and another breakdown of moral respect uh, that uh, we uh, we discuss um, um, because in other countries uh, um, so yes, but again, I want to emphasize that killing, it's not quite right to say is a moral practice because it's immoral in the common sense of the word, but there is a, a system of morality that's behind it that legitimates it. And that's always important to keep in mind, otherwise we reduce people who commit violent acts to act the monster trope again, and we don't understand why. So the question is, you know, why did people do the things that they did? Uh, so again, there's moral inhibitions are reduced, the situation, the structural situation has changed. People are marked and dehumanized. And in that context, it becomes easier to kill. And of course, you have to pay attention to, uh, for many cadre, to a civil war that has been going on for many years. It was violent, but people died. Uh, and again, some cadre during that, the inhibitions changed. Uh, and I think, you know, in all war, the enemy other, when it's viewed in this frame as a battle against someone else, is dehumanized and legitimated uh, within that ideological framework uh, as a legitimate target. And that's the sort of moral aspect to it. And perhaps now if we, if we move to uh, these other factors, these local uh, Customs or norms that uh, you say in your book are required for any regime that wants to commit mass killings against various groups in their population. You say that these local customs or norms or practices need to uh, be in synchronization with these other uh, factors that lead to uh, mass killing, which we've, we've discussed. And so in Cambodia, in Democratic Kampuchea, you stated that the, the practice of disproportionate revenge or this norm of disproportionate revenge, this norm of how power is structured, how the patronage system works and the suspicion that arises out of that. And the norms having faith, saving faith, and having honor in the country. And the right that you say those factors were present in the democratic Kampuchea period, and aided and facilitated the likelihood of mass killings. 
Uh, so the short answer is yes. Um, it's of course, a considerable amount of the book is devoted to that issue, so I don't think I could speak far too long on that. Um, you know, I, I just might make one small aside that one of the paradoxes is that because many people in the countryside uh, have been educated in pagodas, uh, went to the pagoda, the Khmer Rouge also grew upon Buddhist ideas. For example, I mentioned before the notion of renunciation. So you have Buddhist renunciation, renunciation for the revolution, or again, even with consciousness, uh, you need to focus your consciousness in a way that you need to focus your mind on Buddhism and not be distracted by different attachments and desires. Uh, so there, that provides greater resonance for the ideology uh, potentially more appealing to the followers. So that's a, so perhaps a fourth um, factor or idea that made, uh, on your opinion, this um, killing program more acceptable to uh, those required to carry it out. Is that correct? Uh, uh, yes, that's uh, uh, acceptable and even desirable. You deal with these uh, three other cultures or norms. I know it was a main part of your book. But if we can deal with the essence, the state there was a, a practice of disproportional revenge, revenge, and so forth, for democratic Cambodia. How are you able to discern that? And what was the result? How are you able to discern that? Maybe hard to be to be too brief, but I guess, I guess very briefly, uh, the notion of revenge uh, exists in all societies in some sense, but in each place it's different, has different dynamics. Uh, revenge is obviously operative in many different domains of life, uh, but it also is a key word, a key term that was used. I mentioned the uh, red heart of Dam Pang, but uh, as I said, uh, in the Revolutionary Youth, the next essay is class grudge. So this was a word that was taken and was used uh, by uh, the leaders of the CPK, the people who published uh, those issues in party publications and also in the broadcast. Uh, but again, uh, because of conditions in the countryside, uh, the notion that there were structural differences, uh, the rich people looked down upon the poor people, that the, there was one saying that you had the fruit in the countryside and it goes to the towns. I can't remember the exact phrasing of it. But again, the notion that people in the countryside suffered while well, those in the cities had a good life and enjoyed themselves, had wealth. Uh, the notion of class very much resonates with the structural situation, and the Khmer Rouge took it, modified it, and talked about a class grudge uh, in their terminology. They talked about class anger, uh, the national anthem, of course, uh, the central metaphor is blood, the color red, uh, and it talks about uh, changing into anger. Uh, so again, this notion of anger was there, class oppression, uh, class grudge to take vengeance upon those people who have done bad things uh, to you in the past. Uh, and there are other aspects to this that I could go into, but perhaps you don't want me to speak at length. Perhaps, um, if we can move through a couple of um, key points uh, and then uh, back uh, to this. But if I perhaps can read you three short passages and ask your, for your comments, your opinion on them, in light of this issue of um, the utilization of uh, disproportionate revenge, as you talked about in your period. The first um, is a passage from your book, E3, 3, 3, 4, 4, 6, 0, 3, 1, 5, 1, 6, at page 74. And this is where uh, Kel states, and I think Kel was the Khmer Rouge cadre Phnom he state, he stated to you that their political education consisted of telling us to be seized with painful anger 
against the oppressor class. They spoke about this whole time. Put to you a, a second document, and this is at your tab 14.2. It's July 1977, and French 0048-7692. It states, for example, there must be a profound rage towards the class enemy that is embedded in boring holes from within. There must be a high spirit of patriotism and love for the class before we can go all out to search and detect the enemy and sweep the enemies in the court. Unions, units and so on before we can go all out to search មុនពេលនឹងជាងទៅដល់ការដោះស្រាយដូចជាប្រភេទ <coughs> នេះគឺជាមូលដ្ឋានដល់ចំបងសម្រាប់វាប្រយុទ្ធទៅនឹងស្មារដីបណ្ដោះស្មារដីហើយសារចុងក្រោយនោះ <coughs> ยูสเตทดิสโลกมาเลิกลาวเอ่อแต่เปียดได้บาดเลิกลาวในក្នុងឯកសារទុំបដិវត្តជាតែតែ Chim on that no low way Red flag, red flag, I guess I don't part of what don't part of what on that uh uh and flow high uh, Let us wipe out all the Let us strike the victory, 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 Um, I would not want to give a definitive uh, uh, opinion on that because I haven't systematically researched that. The national uh, anthem, though, uh, there's uh, clear uh, evidence uh, that that was played all the time, and it's very similar in terms of the rhetoric of blood and anger. Um, the red flag, I'd like to do my research upon uh, I do have citations in there. And, and really, that's the main uh, point of this question. Uh, we talked about this uh, issue of disproportional by looking at those documents by looking at the language that was used to be in those first documents of having anger and rage in your opinion that type of language in the CPK propaganda is that more likely to increase the chances of mass killing or reducing the chances of mass killing? 
um, more likely to uh, increase the chances, um, and I should also note that you, know, you need to take account of the civil war, I think, as well, uh, and a great deal of anger that must have existed in the civil war after fighting for so many years, and so I think in the midst of the class-action class anger, the fighting itself was also a factor leading to the situation where there's a great deal of anger. And from your review of the uh, primary documents from the DK period, is it your opinion, what is your opinion as to whether or not the CDK leadership encouraged this anger or discouraged it? Um, I I think it's clear that they encouraged it. Uh, but again, it goes back to the civil war, uh, even the U.S. bombing, different sources of motivating anger about, about things that had happened to people to make them angry. Um, but it's every, you know, it's in a great deal of CPK, DK uh, documentation. Um, and I think it's clear that they encouraged it. Documentation. Um, so perhaps now if we go to the, uh, one of the other factors you talk about in the court, and that's the, the way power was structured and uh, the patronage, patronage system uh, that was in place uh, before Democratic Kampuchea, uh, and in how that influenced or what happened during the period uh, uh, and you just wanted to challenge the suspicion by understanding this by understanding this that's the way you can only really fully understand uh, why the purges took place in democratic that cultural norm you say existed and what was, and how, and how it um, affected the way the purges were carried out. Uh, so again, uh, the notion of relationships of dependency, personalized relationships, uh, there are a number of different names for it, uh, but this is something that's omnipresent uh, in Cambodia, and certainly at the time I'm doing my, I was doing my research, uh, but it's also clear that the same notion that there are strings, that people are connected, there are groups of people that have relationships uh, that are affectionate. Um, again, you know, I, during the trial, you've been hearing all sorts of testimony, uh, but and I don't want to characterize uh, the defense argument, but part of it is, again, this notion that there were factions of people who were somehow betraying uh, the party center, the standing committee, uh, one of whom was Goy Tuan. Uh, and again, not looking at the content of the confessions, but if you look at the structure of confessions, you see that what used to be a practice, what we spoke before about writing life histories, the confessions are an inversion of that, where they're written almost as a life history of treason. So instead of joining the party, right, you join the CIA or a traitor's network, and they trace, like a life history will trace a path of revolutionary, the purity of one's revolutionary consciousness. Uh, the confession is written in such a way to show the impurity. But at the very end, uh, as you know all too well, it has emerged clearly lots of documentation that the, uh, in the Doig trial, uh, everybody would finish and do literally what's your string of connections, and this would become the basis for further research. Uh, and if you look at the confessions of in the area where I was, uh, of Boy Tu and Sreng were at the top and were sent to ask anyone not to comment on the veracity of any of those, but they list connections that go all the way down to Region 41, all the way down to the district where I was doing my field work. And after they were taken in, they swept out, to use the language, all the people beneath were gradually taken and if I can stop you there, because certainly, as you say, we, we don't want to be discussing the content of the confessions, but as you say, we're talking about the structural of them. Um, 
ฮาวทาบีบระบอบนังรัจนาสปอนนงกาเรกานังอ่ะบาลูในยี่ห้อมปีปักปุในยุคตาอมนาคนึกตบานเกรีบจอมลังดอยระบีบหน้าโมนสมัยกัมพูชีประชาธิปไตยหรือก็มนกัมพูชีประชาธิปไตยอนวอตถ้าตาอมนาคนั่นเองเกยปุ่งริบเวตูสมาสมาคนี้หรือก็อมนาคนี้เกยปุ่งริบเวตูดอยดอมดอยดอมหรือก็ดอยระเบียบนาหายตาอมนาคนี้เป็นเมียนแหลกกันนะจีปะปุ่ดิยมดอยระเบียบนาได้มนสมัยขมายกระหอม Yes I believe Bạn nhưng mà chưa chạy hà Existed before Việc bàn cao ạc miên là Existed Tăng bị một số mạch của mạch của hóm Vì cao ạc miên là một số mạch của hóm Nên nâu tại miên cao ạc miên của mạch của hóm Nên nâu tại miên cao ạc miên của hóm Nên nâu tại miên cao ạc miên của hóm Nên nâu tại miên cao ạc miên của hóm Nên nâu tại miên cao ạc miên của hóm Nên nâu tại miên cao ạc miên của hóm Nên nâu tại miên cao ạc miên của hóm ยมสมอานไอซาคลายปีไอลุสดาฟนิกเจียร์บายกาหมวกปิกนักกรรมกาลำบอนปรำจบทั้งไงจิมาพยมวยโอสเพียจัดสับปรำปีดมไอกระซามาพยใบไอกระซามเออใบเลอมวยปรำปีใบอังเลโซนโซนใบบุญปีปรำปีโซนปรำบุญขมาโซนโซนปีปรำปีปรำปรำปรำใบรำใบบารังโซนโซนประมวยปีใบใบโซนประมดอลโซนประมวยยิมสมดอกสร้างสมัครสมเพียบดอกประปีเมษาเชงเป็นมุมปิงได้เจียจนเจียจามบันทึกการต่อตาตัวเลยสหกรณ์บอยเยอร์จุดปอนต์ตัวนึงจุดเดือนบอกผู้เกย์ดอยเล็กลายยงตัวเลยเบียตราดอกในรถถังนู้นสำหรับสถานะเพียบเนี่ยยงบันจัดเทียนกาปิไซนู้นคือปินเดมอร์ไซร์บอกปุ๊กเก้ปินเดมอร์ขบานมาสิ่งตักนอมในจอลนาร์บอกปุ๊กเก้ดำไปบอกสมานนี่คือโยงเตลเลอร์ตุ้งปัดเดวอตจ็อกไคอุสมิตนาจัดสับประปีดมไอกซาเล็กดำไปจอยบุญคือไอกซาเออไปเลอมวยไปปรังอีอันอังเกลสองโซนมวยบุญปีประบุญมวยปีทำไมมันเป็นการบอกปลายจีบิซาทำไมเต้ I haven't got the Khmer. I haven't got the Khmer number. I apologise. I know there's not. ไม่ต้องมีการเปลี่ยนได้มันตอนเป็นการสู้สมดุลอะไรที่จำกัดสมกรเคยทำจังปนตายสักเปลี่ยนยาบางสู้อะไรเนี่ยจุดนี้ตอนละทีมันแตะอยู่บอลตะลึงไอ้กษาแต่ที่ไอ้กษาประปรานกนงสัตว์มหากายังนี้ Position about the prosecution as a position about. Tomorrow, I'm going to be here. The contentious document. I believe that the expert is not going to be able to answer the question. So, which question, counsel? We haven't heard the question yet. Yes, we've been talking about this for a long time. I'm sure that's the question. It will be part of the question, but I will be asking the witness to comment on the contentious document. We've been talking about this for a long time. I'm sure that's the question. It will be part of the question, but I will be asking the witness to comment on the contentious document. We've been talking about this for a long time. Searching for strings and how that relates to this issue of patronage and the custom of how power is being used to control and the custom of how power is being used to control and the custom of how power is being used to control and the custom of how power is being used to control and the custom of how power is being used to control and the custom So the next document is the revolutionary flag published in June 1977. I've just given the numbers apart from the French 004. 
ហើយអ្នកណាធ្វើការបង្ហាញ Looking for strings of in relation to the cham, and also looking at biography, trying to find out circles of people and associates. Was that type of practice? partly informed by that cultural practice understanding how power and patronage works and how people are connected by association. Does that demonstrate the use of use of power as structure? Uh, yes, it appears to, and I, I should also uh, note that it might be also appropriate to say form of social organization, not just cultural practice. Uh, some people just sometimes talk about the sociocultural, but it's a form of organization as well, political organization to extent, so they all intersect. Thank you, Your Honor. ហើយសម្ណាការនៅថ្ងៃនេះដល់ពេលឈប់សម្រាក់ហើយអំពីនៅមិនតាន់ចាប់នៅឡើយទេអង្គចម្រះក៏ហាន់ជួយនឹងលោកឲ្យមកបន្តប្រដល់ទៅខេកម្មនៅថ្ងៃស្អែកទៀតហើ